Your brain is one of the most marvelous organs in the universe. Dr. Titus Chu, two-time number one best-selling author, award-winning international speaker, an amazing functional neurologist and brain health expert. When my brain broke, my life started to fall apart. I used to get sick all the time. I also started to develop physical symptoms like vertigo. I'd be sitting at a restaurant and all of a sudden I felt the whole room moving. Literally fell off the chair. I'm like, what is going on? Going on. My life was literally hanging by the thread. They had nothing to offer me besides painkillers. But then when I discovered the link between certain foods and brain inflammation, that's when I started really cleaning up my diet. Pain began to magically disappear without the use of medications. Thank God that I discovered that and put the energy into it because I can say now, just know that healing is possible. Yeah. There are foods that I think people should absolutely avoid at all costs. Those things trigger leaky brain. It can lead to Alzheimer's. It can lead to dementia. It can lead to Parkinson's, to stroke, serious neurodegenerative diseases. Then that leads to not only brain problems, but diabetes, cancer, autoimmunity, on and on and on. But enough of the bad news. Let's start talking about some good news here. Huh? <laughs> Dr. Chu, what led you to get into studying the brain and being so passionate about brain health? Because there's so many different avenues you could have taken. And I know for me personally, like I was saying off camera, my grandmother had Alzheimer's. And so for me, I'm not as nervous about having cancer or a heart attack. Like for me, one of my biggest fears is having dementia and not knowing who I am and having my family take care of me. And so I'm really excited to talk with you, but could you give some background on who you are and how you got so passionate about brain health? Sure. Yeah. So I'm, my name is Dr. Tais Chu. I'm a functional neurologist. And so for me, it started over, wow, I think 22 years ago, I was in a really bad car accident that nearly took my life. I was on my way to work on a scooter and I got hit by a car, ended up being thrown from the scooter, hit the ground. Like I had the wind knocked out of me when I hit the ground. It was like, I couldn't breathe for a few seconds. And I was terrified because I thought I had punctured the lung. But then I finally like my diaphragm reset and I was able to breathe. Thank God I was wearing a helmet at the time because if I wasn't, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. Fast forward though, I, you know, obviously I survived, but I ended up with chronic pain. Like I, in the accident, I ended up dislocating my shoulder, breaking three ribs. So I ended up with chronic pain. And I also, at the time I didn't know it or realize it, but I had also sustained a concussion. And so I tried everything that I could within the conventional medical system to find answers, but I was shocked. I, there was They had nothing to offer me besides painkillers. And so I decided to go outside the box and I went back to school and I got a postdoc in clinical neurology. I got a master's in nutrition. I studied chiropractic, acupuncture, functional medicine, even energy medicine, anything I could get my hands on to figure out why I was in this chronic pain. And I'm so glad that I did because along the way, I began experimenting with all the different things that I learned through school. You know, learning about how diet impacts our health, obviously, but impacts chronic pain. And I experiment with other different modalities like supplements. And through that process, a lot of my body symptoms got better. Like my pain began to magically disappear without, again, without the use of medications. And I knew I was onto something, but through that time, it was really interesting. I developed, began to develop these brain symptoms. Like I started to experience brain fog and what's known as brain fatigue. I also started to develop physical symptoms like vertigo, where I'd be sitting at a restaurant and eating a taco, and all of a sudden, I felt the whole room moving. And I, was, I almost fell off the stool. I remember the first time it happened. I literally fell off the chair. I'm like, what is going on? In addition to that, I found that obviously most people, it's pretty common for people to feel some level of tiredness after they eat. You know, it's just the body's digesting, processing. But I found that after I ate lunch, I'd literally have to like take a nap before I started to see patients again. It took me so much mental energy and willpower just to show up for my patients. And I was able to do so, but at the expense of my own health, by the end of the day, I was just absolutely fried. And so I'm like, something's not right here. 
And so I just sat down and kind of like reflected. I realized that a lot of those symptoms, these brain symptoms that I began to experience that kind of crept up on me, they all started after that car accident. And so I realized, I'm like, oh my goodness, I think I had a concussion. Not only did I have this concussion that was untreated many years ago, what had happened as a consequence, I developed this thing called leaky brain. And over time, that leaky brain began to get worse and worse and worse. And that's when the symptoms began to develop. And again, just like I did previously for my body symptoms, I began experimenting and tinkering with my brain this time with these different types of treatments and modalities. And so some things that I did, um, in addition, you know, like I mentioned before, I changed my diet. So I was eating healthier, avoiding processed foods, junk food. So, you know, more basic stuff. But then when I discovered the link between certain foods and brain inflammation, that's when I started really cleaning up my diet even further. So number one, number two, I began taking supplements that were very specific to brain health. I began to use different technologies that I actually already was using with my patients, you know, photobiomodulation, vagus nerve stimulation, infrared light therapy. So all kinds of anything, super like low tech food, nutrient supplements, all the way to super high tech things. I began to tweak my own nervous system. And again, thank God that I discovered that and put the energy into it. Cause I can say now fast forward years later, I can say that I fully recovered from that concussion. So you know, for those of you, anyone out there who's experienced trauma or a concussion, just know that healing is possible. As long as you can identify the roadblocks as well as the root cause of why you're not healing, there's so much you can do about it. And when you say trauma, you know, there, people use that word often. So I don't know what do you specifically mean by trauma because someone could have like a, a bad childhood where they were abused physically or mentally. And so what kind of trauma are you talking about? Are you talking about like, oh, childhood trauma? Or are you talking like an impact where you had physical trauma? That's a great question. And my specialty is physical trauma. But the interesting thing, the most fascinating thing, mental, emotional trauma or stress can also cause leaky brain as well. And it doesn't even have to be like a crazy, terrible child. Like me growing up, I came from a really loving family. I didn't experience big traumas, emotional, mental traumas growing up. But what I've discovered, even micro traumas throughout the years, or even chronic stress can cause leaky brain and then lead to different types of brain symptoms. And so that's the thing, again, maybe like a bad breakup or maybe just chronic stress with at work or something like that. And what I've found is until that leaky brain is fixed and healed, if you have leaky brain, it's really hard to access the higher centers of our nervous system and brain that allow us to process these traumas. Again, regardless if they're physical, mental, emotional, even chemical trauma. And what I mean by chemical trauma is like exposure to toxins or, you know, processed foods or inflammatory foods, like those things also trigger leaky brain. All the latest scientific research is pointing towards when you have a leaky brain that is untreated, it can lead to Alzheimer's, it can lead to dementia, it can lead to Parkinson's, to stroke, all these serious neurodegenerative diseases when we think about things like dementia or Alzheimer's, it's like, oh, that's something that only old people get, you know, when we're in our 60s, 70s, or 80s. So it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind, right? Mm -hmm. But what the latest research shows again, Alzheimer's and dementia doesn't happen overnight. In fact, research shows that it could start sometimes 20, 30 years prior to the diagnosis. When I tell my patients that some of them get really terrified and stressed out. They're like, oh my goodness. But for me, I think that's actually a massive opportunity to begin turning you know, that ship around. Right? Mm -hmm. Just because we have a family history, I know you said you do, and I know I do as well of Alzheimer's, it doesn't mean that's our destiny. There's so much we can do to begin turning that ship around. Not in the later stages or end stages, even at that point, there's always something we can do to improve quality of life. But I usually find that's a little bit too late, right? And again, my point is one of the key things that I discovered that not only keeps people from recovering from concussions, 
but also opens you know massive risk factor for things like alzheimer's dementia parkinson's ms is leaky brain and with that understanding there's so much we can do like the research shows is if you, if you have a leaky brain there's actually things you can do to begin healing it well before we get into ways that people can help fix a leaky brain how would someone even know if they have leaky brain like you mentioned having brain fog or fatigue or feeling tired and i could see how if someone didn't sleep well the night before the next day they may feel more tired or if they have a lot of stress in their life they may have times where they have more brain fog or they ate a big meal and afterwards they feel like they want to take a nap but it wasn't because they had leaky brain so is there a test that could be done a blood test or how yeah how would people know if they have leaky brain yeah great question so i actually have a quiz I designed a quiz after years of exploring and researching this and actually understanding it through my own personal experience as well as professional experience. Mm -hmm. The majority of doctors out there, including neurologists who are supposedly the brain's experts and specialists, they don't even know about leaky brain, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's not my opinion, it's scientific fact. There's what we what's known as the blood-brain barrier, which is a protective covering that surrounds our brain and it protects us from things like toxins, from inflammatory compounds, from viruses, bacteria. So this protective covering, it's also very fragile though. But in addition to that, it allows for things that should get in. So like the good things like glucose and oxygen and nutrients, right? And that's if it's working. But like I said a second ago, it's super fragile. It's like thinner than a piece of tissue paper. And so with things like trauma, it could become, uh, you can have what we call micro tears, AKA leaky brain. And so my point is, it's like, that's all there in the science, all there in the research. Cause yeah, a lot of people after they, they feel a little sleepy and there's a lot of different reasons why that might happen. One of them could be a minor case of leaky brain or what you had said earlier, Lily, about like not having a good night's rest and just kind of feeling brain foggy. Well, guess what the research shows? Not having a good night's rest, especially chronically can lead to leaky brain. Right. Oh. And so that's the thing for me. It's not like an all or nothing. It's not like you either have leaky brain or you don't because there's varying levels of it. So imagine, again, the analogy I like to use, it's like this wall. It's a barrier that protects your brain and nervous system, which is your most precious and sacred organ. And so you can start to have like breakdown in the barrier in cases of severe trauma, like that car accident. For me, it was like, boom, I had a massive case of leaky brain, right? I couldn't function, like all these different things, especially after that car accident. But it be, the good news is it began to heal on its own over time. And so these symptoms, like the chronic pain started to go away, but the brain symptoms kind of ebbed and flowed. Does that make sense? So that's one of the clues that a person has leaky brain. It's like, you might be feeling good one day, and then you feel brain symptoms the next and you have no idea why. So things like brain fog. Um, a lot of my patients also have light and sound sensitivity. Uh, they might feel more sensitive to movement. You know, I have patients who are like, they can't even go to the grocery store because when they walk down the aisle, all the movement, you know, visual movement triggers them. Other clues that you might have a leaky brain are like memory slips, brain farts, you know, having a brain fart. Those are clues. And then there's more serious clues. Like if you're starting to develop early symptoms of dementia, like you walk into a room and you're just like, why did I walk in here? Right. Or you're like walking around like, have you seen my glasses? Has anyone seen my glasses? <laughs> like these little things, right? They're clues, again, that you might have somewhat of a leaky brain. So those are some clues. But like I said, you know, if you, people don't have access to a brain expert that understands leaky brain, I actually have a, a quiz, a simple quiz that you can take, you know, a few basic questions to assess your risk factor for leaky brain. So that's one way of doing it. Right. So talking to a doctor or taking a simple quiz, there's actually through all my research, I identify there's a simple blood test that you can do. And depending on where you live, sometimes you can even do it in the comfort of your own home. You have the sh test shipped out to you and it's a simple finger prick test that measures or checks your risk factor 
for leaky brain. There's like a lot of different ways you can check for leaky brain. One of my favorite ways when I work with my patients is a simple blood test. You can either go to a lab for, and depending again on where you live, there's, there's certain companies that you can get a test shipped out to you and you do it in the comfort of your own home. Perfect. So now let's say someone identifies, yes, I'm someone who has leaky brain, or even I just don't want to ever have Alzheimer's or dementia and the decaying of the brain. So you had mentioned food and nutrition, supplements, and ancillary things. Let's start with food. What did you specifically do with your diet to improve your brain health? But then is that the same advice you would give to other people who are listening right now too? Sure. Great question. And, you know, I want to start off by saying what works for you may not work for everybody. And so one person's medicine is another person's poison. So, so that being said, for me, my journey in terms of healing from my concussion, as well as fixing my leaky brain, there are certain foods that I found to be trigger foods that actually trigger inflammatory reactions in me. And even before I started on this journey of leaky brain, I had already identified one of them to be dairy. And then again, this was like years before I knew all anything about this stuff, natural medicine, the brain. Growing up, I used to get sick all the time. And I used to have really bad skin, really sensitive skin. Like if I scratched my face or something by mistake, like I have a massive welt or red mark. I'm like, what is, I just thought I was weak. And after getting rid of dairy, all that changed literally almost overnight. Like I stopped getting sick a lot, you know, as much as I did. You know, and you're breaking was, my heart right now. I know. <laughs> and what I, kind of dairy are we talking about? Because, you know, I, I know, really, who... <laughs> I know I've been there. I went through the same morning process. You know, is there a difference with raw it. dairy and pasteurized dairy or a one? There's dairy? good news though. Yeah. Okay. I, have, I have some good news to share. <laughs> so like I said, well, first off, one person's poison could be some person, people's medicine, right? Not everyone is sensitive to dairy. And so, but I had to identify this years ago, got rid of it. That already helped my overall health, my immune system, my mood, my skin, many things, right? And so fast forward, and this was actually kind of recently, um, I was traveling through Europe, I was in France and the French, you know, they love their cheese. Yeah. And so I remember I was at a wine bar at, in France. I'm just in Paris. I'm just like, you know what? I'm just, I'm in France. Do as the French do. Right. And so I'm at this wine bar. I ordered a glass of red wine, you know, chock full of polyphenols, like resveratrol. Yeah. <laughs> that's my excuse. <laughs> glass of red wine, like some Pinot Noir. And I ordered some cheese. And so they brought out this platter. Like the menu was in French, so I didn't know what it was. They brought out this platter. And I think it was like four like slices of cheese. And so I was eating them. And three of them were like, you know, they're good. But, you know, I could f I already I'm pretty in tune with my body. I'm like, I don't know. You know, I, I, I really feel like this might not be. But whatever. I'm in I'm in Paris. Right. The fourth piece of cheese, though, when I ate it, I'm like, oh, my goodness, what is this? Right. It was almost like my body said, yes. Can I right? guess what it was? Was that? I want to guess what it was. Yes. Go for it. It was either a goat's or a sheep's cheese. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you got it, Lily. And not only that, I mean, they actually all were raw. Right. Mm -hmm. And so going back to what you say, the whole thing with pasteurization, the destruction of the enzymes. Yeah, that's really important. Right. So I had actually asked the server, I'm like, you know, what are these cheeses? And all three of them that I mentioned earlier were cows. And as you know, the amino acid sequence of cows, like dairy and, you know, all that stuff is different from human beings. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one was sheep and goat. It was actually a combination of sheep and goat. And it was raw. I'm like, okay, this is an ex now the rest of this is a scientific experiment. The rest of the time, you know, I was there for several weeks. I'm going to test this out. And so, uh, you know, traveled throughout France, went to all these different towns. And there's one area we were in near the French Alps. The French Alps, they're known for their like hard cheeses. Mm -hmm. And so like I went to this little uh, store and I'm like, which one is the sheep? Which one is the goat? And they, they're like, that one there. And so I brought it, had a little picnic, had my little white glass of white wine, paired it with that. And I felt fine the entire, not, no, I didn't feel fine. I felt amazing. I felt happy. 
that I found a, a dairy that my body can actually tolerate. Since that whole experience, I actually do now partake of goat and or sheep cheese and always looking for the raw because that's what's best for my body. So anyways, yeah. So don't worry, as you know, not here to break your heart because I went through that. I, I called it uh, unrequited love. It's like, I love dairy, but it doesn't love me back. But I was wrong. I was just choosing the wrong dairy, right? So I was lactose intolerant my whole life. So I avoided dairy at all costs. And it wasn't until I started learning more about the difference between raw and pasteurized, which I would say for people who have like gut issues, then having the raw and pasteurized makes a big difference. But for people who they have dairy and they don't have gut sy symptoms, but they have like asthma or allergies or breakout in their skin and anything more inflammatory unrelated to the gut, I would say the bigger issue is that they're choosing A1 dairy versus A2. So all yeah. sheep's and goat's cheese are A2, and there are some cow's cheeses in dairy that's A2. So maybe you can try some A2 cow's dairy and yeah, see how it goes. Yeah. No, I did. Actually, the A2 butter, again, in France okay. and Europe is pretty big. For, yeah, I don't know. For me, it's I think it was the cows. Like, But again, I'm open to experimentation. And that's the whole thing with food. It's like it's a whole, it's, for me, it's a continuous journey. Like I consider myself I'm a complete foodie and there's ways of eating, getting all those cravings and those, you know, satisfying needs met. But choosing options that don't also cause brain inflammation or cause health problems. And so anyways, the bigger one though, I found is actually gluten. And so that was the interesting thing for me is because I told you, like I discovered this thing with dairy or what I thought was a thing with dairy, like years ago. And I cut that out and you know, I had it here and there, but with gluten, I was like 80% maybe gluten-free for a long time. And I'm like, I don't really think this bothers. I don't really have issues with it. Right. And I hear this from my patients all the time. Like, I don't think I have an issue with it. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, <laughs> or is that wishful thinking? So anyways, when my brain broke and my life was literally hanging by the thread, I actually did a ketogenic diet at that time. And part of the ketogenic diet, really, you can't have much carbs whatsoever, especially, you know, refined carbs and things like bread or pasta or whatever. So I got rid of that and I felt amazing, right? And it was for multiple reasons, right? My brain was in ketosis, like just super fuel for the brain. All different types of things were happening for me. And I was just like, I had so much energy. My mood was stable. Like I would work for hours. And even into the evening when I got home, I'd still have energy. I wouldn't crash, right? I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I did that for, I think, about three months. And then I started to segue out of it. And some of the things that I started to eat again was gluten. I might have like a dairy-free pizza or I had some pasta or whatever it was or a piece of bread. And I just started noticing again, just my brain, like it, it was like, for me, gluten is a slow burn, meaning it's not like I notice it immediately. Two, three, sometimes four or five days later, your immune system launches an inflammatory response. And so what that would look like for me is I'd eat gluten. I wouldn't notice any difference immediately. I'd be like, oh, this is fine. But then a few days later or a week later, as I continued to eat it, Man, for me, gluten, it, it impacts me in several ways. Number one, mentally, I just don't, I'm not as sharp mentally. I get brain fog. Mm -hmm. But number two, emotionally, psychologically, I start to get dark, right? We all have what's known as a negativity bias where we color things, you know, in negative ways. When I eat gluten, it's a lot harder for me to get myself out of those states, right? Mm -hmm. Where I start thinking negative or these, you know, the inner critic comes up or like catastrophizing. It's really difficult. So for me, I found that gluten not only impacted my mental and like health, being able to like think and focus and concentrate and having good brain endurance, but it also actually impacted me psychologically. And that's the thing. Again, it's not even just my experience. There's a ton of research out there showing how gluten can trigger what we call extra intestinal symptoms. So a lot of people think that if you have a food a problem with food is just going to impact your guts. You might have constipation or diarrhea or IBS, 
But a lot of the research shows that people who have sensitivities to gluten, it can actually trigger neurological symptoms as well as mood disorders. So I'm not imagining it, right? It's very real. So that was the second food that I got rid of. And again, it's not like I never eat it. But what I do is I go into it very aware and I'm sure not to bring any shame or guilt to it. I'm like, hey, I'm making this decision as an adult. I'm going to enjoy it as much as I can right now. And maybe for the next two, three days, I'm going to have some darker thoughts, right? Or I'm not going to be able to focus as well. And as long as I don't continue to do that, then it's like that brain inflammation, that fog starts to lift again. Um, and actually, as a side note, you probably know this, you know, being so into the health space and researching, right? There's actually the the type of gluten that's found in the United States is different from a lot of the types found in Europe. So again, when I go to Europe, when I'm traveling, I'm not as cautious with gluten. Like I'm, I won't go crazy with it, but definitely when I come back home, I, I notice a difference between when I eat gluten in, in the United States versus in Europe, because the actual types, there's a lot of science behind it, right? As you know, when we talk about wheat, when we talk about things like gluten, there's all different types of, it's not just gluten even, there's gliadin, there's all different types of gliadin and gluten that our immune systems to, can react to. And so going back to what I said, one man's poison might be another man's medicine. Oh, hey, uh, why'd the vegan cross the road? To get the broccoli. No, to run away from the chicken. Oh. <laughs> That's a good one. If you're enjoying this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more content. And as Dr. Chu has already briefly mentioned, though later he'll go into more detail about it, infrared saunas can be a very helpful tool for helping us lower our stress. I've personally been using Bond Charge's sauna blanket for 30 minutes before going to bed each night, mainly as a relaxation method, which makes my body feel like jello and has been helping me fall asleep really quickly. But infrared saunas can also help with metabolic health and weight loss. As when using an infrared sauna blanket, our body temperature rises, and so our bodies have to work harder to cool itself down. And this process can result in increased heart rate, similar to moderate exercise, helping boost metabolism, improve blood flow, increase circulation, and help burn calories. One day, my husband and I would love to have a full-blown infrared sauna, but those are quite expensive. So for now, we've been just taking turns using the infrared sauna blanket, which is super easy to clean and can be easily packed up and stored away when we don't want it in our living space. There will be a link in the description where you can get 15% off Bond Charge's sauna blanket and other red light therapy tools, or you can use discount code Lily at checkout for that 15% off. So you keep saying things like, I have a sensitivity to dairy or I may have reactions with gluten. And I really like that you're saying that's you, not everybody necessarily, but come on, there's gotta be one certain food or one ingredient that may be damaging to everyone's brain health, no? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot. And I don't even think they're foods. They're what we call excitotoxins. And so things excitotoxins are things like MSG, right? Monosodium okay. glutamate. MSG is found in a lot of processed foods, right? So there's a lot of different code names for it. it's like textured vegetable protein or you know yeast extract. So it's really important to read labels because all those are code words for MSG, right? What yeast extract? I had no idea. Yes, exactly. There's, I mean, there's tons of different foods. Like, again, it's because the food industry knows that MSG has been demonized. And so a lot of people try to avoid it, right? Yeah. Especially people who are health conscious like you and me and who read labels. So they've devised ways of codifying it. So it's like there. So yeah, MSG, it's an excitotoxin because it's kind of like, I liken it to like, there's a coca leaf, right? Found in nature. And, and then there's cocaine. So obviously there's a massive difference between sucking on a coca leaf that's found in nature versus extracting that single compound, those compounds, and then doing it high dose to the brain. That's what I consider MSG because it was actually found, it was discovered by this Japanese scientist from a type of Japanese seaweed. They found this compound that brought, gave them that umami flavor. It was just like, when you eat it, your brain's like, boom, what was that? 
that's actually so he isolated this compound and then it became msg right so the problem with that is again it's because it floods your brain your receptors in your brain and it over excites your brain mm -hmm. and it's like for people already especially for people who have concussions or some level of brain inflammation or toxins of stress when the brain becomes overexcited you can actually it can actually lead to cell death to neuron death right it's like when you consume them because it's such a high level it can if the brain cells are already unstable or unhealthy then the brain cells can literally excite themselves to death. Because normally when a brain is healthy, it's all about communication, right? Your brain is one of the most marvelous organs in the universe. You have more brain cells than you have than there are stars in the galaxy sitting between your two ears right now, right? And it again, brain function, how well we think, how we feel our ability to handle stress, all of these things, how well we sleep, how much pain we have or don't have, all boils down to the communication between the brain cells. So the better and more clear the communication, the better your brain works, right? But when we consume foods like MSG or processed foods that contain MSG or yeast extract, Another one to watch out for is spices. I'm like, what do you mean by that? Yeah. I haven't seen research linking spices with MSG, but I'm suspect. Anyways, when you consume foods like that, all of a sudden this clear communication becomes chaotic. Your brain just gets flooded. And like I said, if your brain's already a little bit, it's not like tip top shape to begin with, it can actually create overexcitation leading to brain cell death, right? So yes. In answer to your question, there are foods that I think people should absolutely avoid at all costs. So that MSG, things like aspartame, food coloring, right? All the different yellows and the blues. Those are some of the ones that are super bad. And then obviously trans fats, right? Because going back to this whole analogy of communication, I remember when I was going through my master's in nutrition, I remember reading this. It's like, you know, you, most people think, and I did at the time, it's like you eat food, it's like fuel, right? It just gives you energy and it's fuel. It's partially that, but it's also the building blocks of our entire brains and bodies, right? And one of the things, again, when you eat something like wild caught salmon, you know, clean sources of fish, that fat gets embedded into your brain cells membrane. When you eat things like trans fats, that fat then replaces those omega-3 fatty acids. All of a sudden, instead of like the best high-speed internet connection, you all of a sudden have this rusting old telephone wire that's very fragile and brittle. So yeah, trans fats is also super high up there. And there's a bunch of other ones, but I don't want to be a, a Debbie Downer. But the last one I think that I'll mention is seed oils, like vegetable seed oils can create massive states of inflammation, throwing off the whole balance of omega-3 fatty acids, which are very good for the brain and very good for the immune system and heart and increasing levels of, as you know, the omega-6 fatty acids. And when you have that skew, as most people do in modern society, then that leads to not only brain problems, but all types of degenerative health issues, diabetes, cancer, autoimmunity, on and on and on. But enough of the bad news. Let's start talking about some good news here, huh? So those are all the ones we should be avoiding, but what for you now are the foods that are absolutely super great for brain health in general? Yeah, absolutely. So um, top things, I think, again, going back to the omega-3 fatty acids. So foods high in omega-3 fatty acids, wild-caught salmon, you know, farm raised, as you probably know, is like a lot of the farm raised are fish are full of toxins and actually are fed grains many times and have high levels of omega-6. So it defeats the purpose. So again, wild caught whenever possible, you know, and looking for the smash fish because they're smaller. Mm -hmm. So they don't have as many of the heavy metals, unfortunately, that are found in the ocean. So salmon, mackerel, anchovies, the herring, so on and so forth. So those are top, right? And then organ meats are fantastic if you can stomach it. Uh, I actually lived in Japan for, that's actually where I was in a, my car accident. And I remember having raw beef liver. And the first time I had it, I'm just like, 
Ooh, what was that? So yeah, that was amazing. So organ meats are super good, as you know, like chock full of, you know, nutrient density, but you have to make sure you get it from good sources. Because as you know, especially the liver, it processes a lot of the toxins. So organ meats are great. Um, more realistically, like grass-fed beef and grass-fed steak, um, grass-fed lamb. I have, I mean, my refrigerator is chock full of all the grass-fed goodies. When we talk about brain health and brain nutrients and brain healing and brain prevention, polyphenols are these plant compounds found in different types of fruits and vegetables that have been shown to protect the brain from damage, to decrease brain inflammation. A lot of these polyphenols found in things like broccoli, so sulforaphane, and found in things like blueberries, terostilbene, found in Pinot Noir, <laughs> resveratrol, <laughs> they can actually heal a damaged blood-brain barrier, right? And so, yeah, polyphenols found in different types of plants and fruits. And when we're going into fruits, like, again, everyone's different in, you know, the different ratios of the foods, but I always recommend to my patients to eat low glycemic fruits as much as possible. Like make that a staple if you're going to choose fruits. For example, blueberries, blackberries, um, organic strawberries, like eating those lower glycemic fruits kind of more as a staple, you know, and trying to limit them, not eat too much. And then kind of as a treat, have the higher glycemic ones like bananas or mangoes, things like that. So overall, that's kind of how I eat. Actually, you know, once in a while, I'll have some grains. Sometimes I have gluten-free oatmeal for breakfast. Sometimes I'll eat some rice, right? Clean sources of rice. But for the most part, yeah, I'm a total caveman. You know, I love it. <laughs> yeah, A caveman that enjoys the finer pleasures in life, like raw French cheese. <laughs> you know, you've mentioned alcohol now several times. So I have to ask, you know, isn't that one of the worst things for your brain? Yes and no. Again, it really depends. You know, that's the thing. You know, there's so much conflicting research out there. Actually, there's research showing that alcohol can cause leaky brain. But that research article was talking about binge drinking. So it's like kind of like not drinking and just doing like an all night bender can literally trigger a leaky brain. On the flip side, if you actually look at um, the blue zones, people who live beyond 100, a lot of them outside of maybe I think one of them that was like some Seventh-day Adventist or something for religious reasons, they all of them drank alcohol on a consistent basis. When we talk about alcohol, it's obviously can be classified as a toxin. My life, it's about finding balance. What are the toxins in versus toxins out? So it's like, I do drink, but when I do drink, I choose organic wines as much as possible, right? Low glycemic organic wines, number one. Number two, I drink in moderation. So for me, a big part of it, and don't get me wrong, I've battled some addictions in my lifetime. And so and there were times where I used alcohol really like in a very unhealthy way. And so it's like how you approach it, I think, makes all the difference, not only in terms of the actual behaviors, like how much you consume, but also your mindset around it. And then finally, I make it a big part of my lifestyle to do cleanses, to enhance detoxification. A big part of my wellness routine is infrared sauna. Right. I try to do that. We have an infrared side. I try to do that at least once, sometimes twice, three times a week and doing cold showers, you know, hot, cold showers to help enhance detoxification and the production of glutathione, which is one of the most powerful antioxidants that our body produces. So, so it's like I've dialed in these different rituals that help me maintain a healthy brain. But once, sometimes twice a year, I'll do a more hardcore cleanse where I'm just like, I don't do alcohol. I don't do any dairy or any cheese or any uh, gluten, right? And I eat super clean. I do ketosis, all those things. But I think, again, you know, this is my opinion. I think it, alcohol can be incorporated even in a healthy way to a healthy lifestyle. Okay, cool. That gives, I'm sure, some people like a sigh of relief. Having some things here and there is okay. Um, so we've addressed kind of the food, the good foods, the bad foods. And then you mentioned supplements. Are there any specific supplements you say are great for brain health? 
Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about leaky brain, and this is more for people who do have more serious symptoms of brain inflammation or leaky brain, like we talked about, maybe like more severe brain fog or memory issues, chronic headaches, chronic pain, light sound sensitivity, anxiety, depression. These are very common symptoms of brain inflammation. One of the the nutrients that I've identified through my research, it's what's known as a specialized pro-resolving mediator, SPMs for short, specialized pro-resolving mediators. For people who just want to be healthy and maintain optimal brain health, I think things like omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, EPA in a supplement form. You know, I personally take one to 2,000, sometimes higher if I feel like I need it, you know, grams a day or milligrams a day. Yeah. Do not take 2,000 grams a day. <laughs> so, And again, by the way, as you probably know, this is not medical advice. This is educational purposes. So I personally take like one to two, sometimes up to four, if I feel like I need it, of fish oils a day. And that's because I feel pretty healthy. I'm going for optimal health. So for people out there, like something like that could be already helpful and useful. But for people who are struggling with brain inflammation or leaky brain, who've had a concussion or starting to have memory issues or anxiety, in addition to the omega-3s, I also recommend stacking it with the SPMs. So yeah, that's probably one of the top nutrients out there that I recommend. And the reason why I'm focusing on it, because not a lot of people, including a lot of doctors, have ever heard of it, but it's so important when it comes to inflammation especially brain inflammation. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. So is it a capsule? Is it a powder? Is it a liquid? How do people... Yeah, is... you can get it in... A, I, the ones that I take is actually a little gel cap. Okay, cool. So we got the nutrition, we got the supplements, and then the last thing was kind of like ancillary things. You had mentioned the word toxins often, like we're putting toxins in. And I think of toxins like we got EMFs, radiation, BPA, all sorts of different toxins. Is there one particular toxins if you had to pick one? Because I know there's many and there's a lot we can't even control. But if there's one that people could really try hard to avoid, what would be that toxin they would want to avoid? Oh my goodness. Yeah, this is talking about Pandora's box. <laughs> you know, it is a sad state of affairs that majority of it has so many toxins coursing through our blood vessels right now, right? And so, wow. I mean, when it comes to brain health, obviously heavy metals are very detrimental pesticides, right? So that's why it's always best to choose organic as much as possible. Mycotoxins, I mean, that can be an entire another podcast we do, like mold toxins from mold are really detrimental. So yeah, for me, you know, if I just think about the toxins in part of it, it's a very depressing picture. So, but I'm, you know, a romantic optimist, right? In the sense that I'm like, okay, that's there. What can we do about it? So yeah, detox, in addition to just the avoidance of toxins, we also, the great news is there's ways where we can naturally enhance detoxification. Some of the ways that I do is through specific types of foods. So a lot of the cruciferous vegetables, um, a lot of foods that contain sulfur, like radish, uh, kohlrabi. There's a lot of different foods out there that, you know, wasabi, even talking about Japanese cuisine, they can help enhance detoxification. Even something as simple as broccoli and broccoli sprouts, right? So foods can help enhance detoxification. There's also simple lifestyle things. And I already talked about them like infrared sauna or just moving. Like research shows that simple just walking for 30 minutes a day, five times a week or three times a week decreases your risk for Alzheimer's because the way we excrete toxins is through our breath, through our urine, our poop, you know, through our sweat. And so for me, yeah, infrared sauna is one of the best things. Or just if you don't have access to one, just sweat. And if you have a hard time sweating, find yourself a steam room or find yourself like a traditional sauna and really, you know, gradually begin sweating. Because that's one of the most powerful things you can do to help detoxify. And then, yeah, there's all this, all the rage is like the cold therapy, contrast therapy, you know, kind of fluctuating between hot and cold. All that stuff is super, super helpful. You can find Dr. Titus Chu on Instagram, Facebook, and his website, brainsafe.com. I'll leave links to his social media and his books in the description. And again, that's where you can find discounts to infrared products. Don't be silly, subscribe to Lily, and I'll see you in the next one.